You know, I'm still full from Thanksgiving dinner, but I'm not too full to read some viewer mail. You are locked on MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans. Welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all the Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully. I am an Emmy-nominated television producer who's been a baseball podcaster for well over a decade now, and I finished five seasons, about to start my sixth year at the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks so much for making us your first listen. Follow us at Locked On MLB Pods. Twitter or whatever it's called now. Is it still called Twitter? I don't know. Neither do you. Uh, same thing on Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on the whatever the thing is called now. Sully Baseball Podcast and Instagram. Follow us on YouTube. And please, 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 if you post on uh, any form of social media, be sure to put the hashtag Everyday Sully. So I know who's listening to us every single day. Hey, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more right now. New customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Or as we used to say in Massachusetts, get started. Um, hey, I'm going to do a couple of things today. I'm going to be answering a bunch of comments and everything that you people have sent to me, either on comments on YouTube, comments on Twitter, comments on Instagram, wherever you Some people throw paper airplanes, they land in my car, all these different things. Uh, later in the episode, the, for the third segment, we're going to be having our buddy Javier, Javier Reyes from Lockdown Padres to talk about his very, very confusing franchise. And uh, later this week, we are going to be having uh, Jeff Snyder from Locked On Dodgers, Lindsey Crosby from Locked On MLB Prospects, Brandon Warren from Locked On Twins, and we're going to be in doing a full episode of What If Fridays, which we're going to be talking about the first of several injuries that changed the course of a franchise's history. There have been a couple times in baseball history where someone got hurt and the team went on to play and lose a razor, th razor thin, easy for you to say, postseason series. And I look at some of those injuries that if this thing didn't happen, this injury didn't happen here or didn't happen there, the entire trajectory of a franchise could have been altered. And so that's going to be a little bit we're going to be doing at least one of them on Friday, uh, depends on how much time we have. And we have some special podcasts that, are, um, that I'm currently editing for Christmas week. And some of them will be on location. So you'll see, hopefully have some fun with that. Hey, uh, let's uh, look at some of the viewer stuff that we got, which will lead to our trivia question. The trivia question I had when I had uh, Ethan Smith on, which was what two members of the Baseball Hall of Fame are tied exactly tied for the most games played in the history of the Pittsburgh Pirate franchise. And there's a lot of players who played many, many years who are Hall of Famers, who played many, many years with the Pittsburgh Pirates. My dear friend Marcel, who goes by Cubs fan with an eight out there in Switzerland, said his guess is Willie Stargell and Roberto Clemente. You got one of them right, and I would have bet the farm that Willie Stargell would have been one of them. But nope, yeah, nope, nope, nope. Dan Bourgeois got it correct. Honus Wagner and Roberto Clemente played exactly 2,433 games each. If one of them just played one more game here or there, we know Clemente had a lot of uh, injury issues during his remarkable career. If played one more game, they would have the all-time record. Uh, Stargell is third, but Wagner and Clemente stonk right there. So um, let's take a look at some of the things that we that have come in, some of them by YouTube, some of them by Instagram, some of them by Twitter. Um, Mose F wrote to me, 
and said, hey, Sully, I got a question. Well, maybe I'll have an answer. Why do you think there's such a nonlinear relationship between player payroll and team success at this moment? Now, I, 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 like, I understand what you're saying. And, of course, one of my favorite things to point out when people say, you know, baseball is not fair because only the highest payrolls, you know, win. If you have a low payroll, you have no chance uh, to win, blah, 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 blah. But I'm just going to go pull this up right now. Baseball payrolls of 2023 from the from the top to the bottom. And um, so this is going through. Um, I'm going to the bet MGM. The team with the highest payroll in 2023 was the New York Mets. The second highest were the New York Yankees. The third highest were the San Diego Padres. What do those three teams have in common, despite all having payrolls of $236 million or more? What do they all have in common? None of them made the postseason. Uh, The Phillies, Dodgers, and Blue Jays would come next. Seventh would be the Angels. Again, not a playoff team. Um, you know, 11th, the Giants, not a playoff team. Meanwhile, the 29th payroll, the second to last, and actually not that much higher than the Oakland A's with the Baltimore Orioles, who won 100 some odd games. The 27th highest, uh, you know, the, the, well, the fourth lowest payroll was Tampa. They won, uh, 90 some odd games. Then you saw, uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks who had the ninth lowest payroll, went to the World Series. The Miami Marlins, who had the eighth lowest payroll, went to the postseason. The Milwaukee Brewers, I mean, there are more between 19, the 19th lowest, uh, 19th highest payroll, 21st highest payroll, 22nd, uh, 27th, and 29th highest payroll, all went to the postseason, and the top three didn't. Which, to me, shows something. First of all, the correlation between payroll and success, uh, they don't always line up. It depends on what you're spending money on. And also, those teams that are at the bottom have built up their, their, their team with very young players who haven't been able to cash in yet. That's one of the reasons why I beg the Baltimore Orioles to increase their payroll and make a big splash at the trade deadline, even if it meant letting go of some of those precious minor leaguers because the future was now. Now, why does that happen? Because some teams do a better job of developing players and some teams do a better job of gathering big budgeted players and seeing if they fit. Now, It's the team's job to put the best product on the field and to try to get the best players. If that means overpaying, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. What is the correlation? Well, there may be a couple of years that come up where all the top three teams make the postseason, all the bottom teams don't. It has to do with player development and spending money wisely, spending money intelligently. Now, I have no problem, zero problem, with the Mets and the Padres spending like drunken sailors. Do you know why? Because their fan base are desperate for a postseason victory. And they went for it. And you take a look at some of the teams. The Dodgers are always there. The Phillies are always there. The Braves are always there. It's about the money you spend, how intelligently you spend it, and how well you create a foundation from the basis of the your farm system. That's kind of sort of how it works. And you'll see that probably some of those successful teams reside between like 6 and 15 in the payroll there. It may be something that, we, that fluctuates over time. We've seen that the top two teams went in there to try to buy their way out of a long, frustrating dry spell. And I don't have a problem with that because if it would work and if the Padres had clinched or the Mets had clinched, their fans would be elated and everyone would say, oh, they just bought themselves the championship. Well, thank you for buying it. But what is the nonlinear relationship? Because the same reason that sometimes you see a movie that is a low budget movie and does well, sometimes you spend the money on the right things, sometimes it clicks. And in order to do that, the best case scenario 
is to have a good farm system that develops the good team, and then you use your resources to keep them together. And I have a feeling that's what the Mets are going to try to do. And I'm going to talk to Javi Reyes when he is a guest later on in the show and see if he thinks that's going to be the root of the Padres moving forward. Hey, let's talk a little bit about our friends from FanDuel. Now, FanDuel is the number one sports book in America. And with the NFL season coming together, fermenting, and you're starting to see which teams look really good, customers, new ones, can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, it's the official partner of the National Football League. All right, let's see what else we have in terms of some questions that we have from our viewers here. Um, oh, Moz F. Uh, no, that's I, that's one I just read. Uh, Down with the war. Uh, Joel W384 uh, says, after listening to the second episode, I now know why it's called the Negro Leagues. He's referring to uh, when Turkey Stearns' granddaughter, Vanessa Ivy Rose, was a guest on the show. And we talked about uh, the fantastic podcast that she was a part of. Uh, so I'm a big Josh Gibson fan. I hope to hear about, more about him and Buck O'Neill. I'm glad to see that people are listening to you and listening to that great podcast. Uh, Bradley Horn, 28. Oh, this is one I wanted to get to. How would you feel if Major League Baseball had an award show similar to the CMAs where players and fans dress for the red carpet and get their awards there on stage from their teammates, rivals, and fans and say a few words when they receive the award. I would love it. Are you kidding me? I've wanted a show like that for a long, long time. I think it would be fabulous. Now, I think, I mean, look at, I think you should have the awards uh, presented before the postseason. But maybe you have that big award ceremony at the end of the league championship series or just before the world series, when people are watching, people are interested in baseball. Look at people love award shows, even phony ones. All award shows are phony. And I'm saying this as an Emmy nominated television producer, but think about it. Every single award was just made up by some group. Look at, I love the Oscars and, and I could very well do locked on Oscars. Cause I just, I always watch the films. I always get into it. Even though I know it's kind of meaningless, I don't care. We all love something that's kind of meaningless and dumb. But, you know, people, the, the Oscars were formed in the, you know, about 100 years ago. It was like 1927 is when they did the first one. So it's almost 100 years of it. And it was an academy of other, you know, other filmmakers. And, oh, let's hand out this award to Wings and let's hand this award to the Broadway Melody and boom. Yeah, that's right. I just named the first two films to win Best Picture right off the top of my head. Don't try me on this. But if they come up with the VMAs or the MTV you know, Music or whatever it is, they were all just sort of the first. They're all invented. And so people like to watch award shows. People like to watch celebrities in tuxedos getting an award, getting up, getting a standing ovation. And for and sometimes for awards that mean nothing. Imagine if it's for the Cy Young. Imagine the one night you hand out the MVP, the Cy Young Award, Manager of the Year, uh, Comeback Player of the Year, Rookie of the Year, the Silver Sluggers, the Golden Gloves, all that crap. You hand it out in one night, and you get to see Juan Soto in a tux. You get to see Shohei Otani in a tux. I'll do you even one better. You'd have that, and at the end, they you, know, you have all the big awards, and at the end, they announce who's in the Hall of Fame. Look at right now, it's done what? You find out by a tweet? You find out by watching MLB Network? Put on a show. I'm old enough to remember when the ESPYs 
were started. They were started in the mid 90s and they were a joke. But ESPN was so big and so powerful that suddenly it became the event that that became the prototype for it. You would see Ken Griffey Jr. or Cal Ripken or Kirby Puckett, whoever it was, in a tux. How, how cool would that be? Tell me you wouldn't watch that show. I'd watch it big time. Uh, by the way, the last one I'm going to say was uh, this one is from uh, Kermit Kyle. I may have answered this one before. Uh, he wanted to know, besides the Red Sox players of the mid to late 80s and 90s, the, some of the, who are some of the other players that made you fall in love with? with the game as a child, as a teenager, who was your, some of your favorite players who didn't play for your favorite team? Um, anyone on the 1979 Pirates, Willie Stargell, Dave Parker, uh, Omar Moreno, um, uh, Burt Blylevin, John Candelaria, Kent Tecalve. I love that whole team. Even though I was a Red Sox fan, I did really like watching Reggie Jackson. He was a lot of fun. Uh, I had a bunch of my cousins who were big fans of the Philadelphia Phillies, and um, I loved Schmidt. I used to pretend I was Tug McGraw. Um, we found out later that Kirby Puckett was a uh, uh, not the nicest person in the world. But I didn't know that during his playing days. And during his playing days, I would I just loved watching him. I loved watching him. I was always a big fan of badass relief pitchers. So I loved Raleigh Fingers. I loved Lee Smith. I loved Bruce Souter. I thought all of them were super cool. Um, I loved ace pitchers. Ace pitchers fascinated me. Randy Johnson was always one of my favorite players, even when he was a wild pitcher early on with the Mariners. I really liked Mark Langston too. You know, when he was, he had people like to talk about him like he was a chump because he was in the trade for Randy Johnson. He was terrific at his heyday. Um, and uh, I wish I appreciated Ricky Henderson more. I really do. Uh, Griffey Jr., who I saw play in the minor leagues is my favorite non-Red Sox or Giant player. I have to put that caveat because I loved Bonds. I always loved Bonds. And um, and then you have those individual moments. Like, you know, Hershiser's that one amazing year that Hershiser had just was absolutely, absolutely stupendous. So, I mean, I just loved the game. And so I loved the, seeing it being played well. You know, George Brett played the game well. It was fascinating to watch. It was fascinating to watch Rod Carew play. You know, I remember when Benito, see, you know, Benito Santiago, when he used to throw from his knees, or Eric Davis, who, if he didn't get injured and ultimately get cancer, I believe he would have been a Hall of Famer because he was one of the single most talented players I've ever seen in my life. And evidently, also one of the great nice people in the game of baseball. So I just think about those players who just made it fun you know, fun to watch them, fun to see them hit. Dale Murphy, who was a guest on the podcast several years ago, was another one of those players. It was just fun to watch them play. So those are some of the ones who were not Red Sox, but were uh, just maybe love the whole game. You know, that's what it's like to be a sports fan. If you are a sports fan, i got to tell you, Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming service on YouTube. Lockdown Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first-ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Come on, check it out. Hey, look at as promised, fan favorite, Javier Reyes is back. It's been a bit. It's been a bit. I thought I was going to have you a lot during the postseason at the beginning of the year. <laughs> I once again picked the Padres to win the pennant. I am the – I'm much better at picking Padres no-hitters than I am picking Padres pennants. But uh, how you doing, buddy? I'm I'm hanging in there, man. It's been a – It's Javier Reyes of Locked Up Padres. Javier Reyes of Locked Up Padres. <laughs> yeah, that's me. That's the that's name. Yeah, um, yeah. Look, it's been a rough few months. Uh, yeah. What can I say? Uh, it's been rough for a while from august to september and even to now with all the like weird behind the scenes chicanery and the 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 waiting until literally like a day before thanksgiving before we finally got the announcement of a new manager the fact that they had to get a new manager in the first place is a whole nother thing the spending reduction reports all sorts of stuff um so so not going great 
for Padres folk, but I think one of the things I've been trying to emphasize on, emphasize on my show, if people wish to listen, they can, um, is that there are a lot of teams in a lot worse positions than the oh, Padres. Yeah. Oh, I would yeah. actually argue that the Baltimore Orioles are in a worse position than the San Diego Padres. Why? Because I haven't seen any proof yet that they will not do what they always do, which is pretend to care, not care, and then lose all their best players in about a year or two. So, yeah. Again, at least the Padres seem to care. So that's well, me. and I. It's funny. I. It's like you heard the first few segments of the show. That's the reason why I screamed at the Orioles to let go of some of their prospects at the trade deadline because yeah, you stumbled across a season where you're good and the Yankees and Red Sox are bad, and they didn't add it. They mm-hmm. didn't add. You know, they didn't make a blockbuster. They made a couple of things here or there, but this is not a crossover with locked on Orioles this is a lock cr- locked on Padres. Um, That's how Peter Seidler dying um, <laughs> yes. was, I mean, obviously beyond just the sadness of him dying, you got the sense that he wanted to win. He was pushing the chips to the center of the table. Oh yeah. Knowing that he didn't have much longer. And so you remove the uh, person spending like there's no tomorrow because there is none. Mm-hmm. from the Padres. I mean, obviously it would have been great if they had won. And I'm sure the added element to the fact that the Padres actually only finished two games behind the eventual National League champion was uh, makes you think, of, you know, if we'd gotten off to a mediocre start, maybe we would be in a position yeah. to get to the Instead postseason. Of horrendous start. Uh, yeah. And refusing to win more than three games in a row for basically the whole season until September, which is insane. Uh, then maybe, yeah, it's that you bring up a great point though. It's kind of like they just had to not be the worst in every scenario. You know what I mean? I mean, we could talk about the extra innings losses, oh my the one score game losses, all that yeah. stuff. Like if they just fix that, like they they have a good team. Players played well in a vacuum this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had the Cy Young winner yeah. of the National League. Yeah. They had a Platinum Glove winner. Yeah. Like like it's just they had a lot. But like, and I think that if you check on like fan graphs, they have like a clutch rating that they do, which takes into a bunch of different factors. I think like since the year two thousand, they're in like the top five, like for lowest like clutch percentage among every team for in every situation, like genuinely dreadful the Mets were bad too but they were bad all over the place you know the Padres it was specifically when the game was on the line can you do the extra push get the big home run Machado most of his home runs this year were solo shots right or when they were already up by a lot or down by too much so it was just all over the place really rough and with Peter Seidler gone yeah the question is how does that change things you know well I mean nothing makes sense with this Padres team if you look and you say okay Machado's got his 30 home runs uh, Soto has an OPS of 930. You know, Bogarts, you, you have, you know, of your nine starters, eight of them are double digits in home runs. So, oh, okay, they've got lots of power. And, oh, they got the Cy Young Warner. Yeah. Oh, great. And you got Michael Walker had a good season. And, you know, then you had, uh, um, you know, Josh Hader had a good season. Oh, great. Did they win 90? Did they win 95? No, they barely they had to have a great September. To get above, it made no sense. It made yeah. this year made absolutely no sense, and I think it really does. It's funny. This is the reverse of Bob Melvin's year when he was managing the Diamondbacks in 07, when they actually mm. finished the year with a negative run differential, but they mm. won 90 games and won the division and had home field advantage throughout the National League playoffs because they kept winning every single one run game, mm-hmm. and so this was the opposite. Yeah, yeah, and that exactly. and you look at the talent of that 07 team. There was like they had like Eric Burns and and uh, Tony Clark. I mean, it's like what? I mean, <laughs> this is this was there was nobody on that team, and they won ninety some odd games. And then you look at this team. So I get this is karma coming back. You know, whatever whatever yeah. whatever deal he made with the devil. Um, <laughs> and now Melvin went back home to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Which is the first, you know, he he was smelling the 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 problem in Oakland when he skedaddled from Oakland, mm-hmm. like, oh boy, you're not going to rebuild, are you? Uh, scram, and now <laughs> he sniffed around like, oh, you were spending that money because that guy was dying, uh, scram, and now if he goes to where he probably has always wanted to manage, which is the Giants, um, I don't think Schultz a bad choice. Schultz did a good job with St. Louis. Schultz was 
she was shafted by the by the Cardinals, and I think this is a no brainer. This is not a, a this is not a managerial decision of a team that's looking to totally scrap it. This is a managerial decision of all right. Well, let's see what we got. Let's see what we can do. Even if there is a Soto trade, we have to assume they're not going to get nothing back for Soto. Um, I I think this is a I, I still think this is a contender. I do too. Um, and aside from what we already alluded to, which is like with the Orioles and stuff like that, where they've at least shown the ability to spend, even if they have a spending reduction, like this, the report's like 200 million. You can clearly win with that. And, and again, I'm not saying that there are all things bad that the Orioles do, right? Like you do have to save up your farm and stuff like that, but that's more than enough. Um, I think that that report is more of a, a, a um, an indictment on the possibility of, going after big fish or re-signing Juan Soto, right? I think that's what it means, but it, I don't think it means that they can't go out here and find some cheap free agents, maybe some international free agents, right? I, I'm not going to, I'm not saying Yamamoto, right? Like that's the big one that everyone's excited about, but Jung Ho Lee, right? Like maybe he doesn't go for as much as people um, expected, right? Hassan Kim, they got him and he was awesome this year. So mm-hmm. like maybe they, they've had some luck, a little bit of luck uh, when it comes to international free agents. So right. we'll see how that goes. And if you just look at the fact that they were like historically on clutch, which I talked about before, they had a really great run differential this year. Mm -hmm. They had good pitching. Even if they lose Blake Snell, they still have good pitching. They've got a really good farm system. And if there's one thing uh, GM AJ Preller is good at, who I have a lot of problems with, uh, it's just procuring a new farm system after all these trades, they make all these moves, sometimes disastrous Mm -hmm. ones, like the case of, say, Mike Clevenger, the case of, say, Ty France, right? Like, they lose good players. And the Juan Soto trade, they give up everything. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, they have this 17-year-old catcher who's, like, already in double-A exciting people? Like, that's crazy. They have Jackson Merrill. They have Robbie Snelling, Dylan Lesko. And then deeper people, like Grand Pauly, they have all sorts of great prospects to either be excited about for the future or use as assets in a trade. And I think that's where I'd be interested with the Padres is where it's, like, because of their spending reduction – who's a pitcher that's under control, maybe in pre-arbitration you could go mm-hmm. after. Corbin Burns is someone that a lot of people talk about. There's probably some other people I can't think of off, off the top of my head, but they can definitely make moves. Um, and even besides the moves, as long as they aren't historically bad again right. in the clutch with runners in scoring position, they have it. Xander Pogarts' his first season, mm-hmm. still put up a 4.4 wins above replacement. Like, that's good. The problem was that he hit, I think, about like 100 with runners in scoring position, right? If they aren't that bad, if you get a regression to the mean of right. just how players perform, they should be fine, at least fine enough to make a wild card spot. I'm not even talking about catching the Dodgers or anything like that. So there's a no. lot of optimism for sure. And I think there's going to be a, I think there's going to be a bunch of kind of older free agents who won't be like long term deals but you could use to plug certain holes while some of those players just state. And also just think about this for a second. Let's just say the Padres reduce their payroll by 50 million mm-hmm. by 50 million. They would have the same payroll roughly of the Braves Rangers and Astros, mm-hmm. you know, so it's not like, you know, you're asking them to, pull a miracle like you know like arizona or baltimore or you're asking tampa like you're you're not asking to be you know bargain basement team Mm -hmm. you're still that's still a quality you could still have a quality payroll and as we mentioned in the first segment that you know payroll does not always correlate to victories Mm -hmm. as the diamondbacks and baltimore and tampa bay all showed Mm -hmm. but you know you can put get talent on the team Mm -hmm. and remember you're not going to replace Juan Soto, but make sure Juan Soto's departure isn't filled with like a below, you know, below league average player. Yeah. You know, just make sure it's what I, it's Eddie Rosario, um, uh, Jorge Soler syndrome mm-hmm. with the Braves when they lost their entire outfield and they made sure there's a major leaguer everywhere. Mm. I think the Padres will be, yes, losing Snell is going to stink, and it's going to suck to not have Soto if he is indeed traded. But Mm -hmm. you're going to get something back for Soto. Yeah. And And you have a good farm system, too. And and look, it's not like 
they don't have stars and everyone's like what the hell we finally got a star and you're not keeping him that's what other loser teams do no right. we have tatis we have machado we have bogarts whatever like we, you can argue the ins and outs and who they should have kept i personally would have been like lock up we have tatis and then keep the 25 year old ted williams right that would have been my thing don't care about the rest we'll figure that out later even though right. i love machado but this is the reality three stars is more than enough right yeah. now you have to figure out those in betweeners your um who is that guy in the rangers that broke out a little bit like now, adolis garcia a little bit yeah. is a good example um who, who's really fast by St. One. Louis, by the way who's yeah i know by... the, the the really fast one i'm bl- blanking on his name right now carter some evan carter evan, evan carter, carter yeah, yeah have an evan carter type right like these solid sort mm-hmm. of players that can do and can produce for you um mitch garver types you know what i mean that is stuff that you could certainly spend on yeah but it's not like they have to go out and get otani they yeah. don't have to go out and get so i don't even saying, know what other bats are available uh cody bellinger right like those are the obvious no. ones i you think cody bellinger is a trap there. i think cody bellinger really? is a trap i think absolutely. really okay yeah i think he's a trap i think someone's going to sign him and it's going to be a Vernon Wells situation. Really? I it, okay. Yeah, okay. I completely. I, 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 I wouldn't touch him with a with a cattle prod. <laughs> He's it, out. It, He's out. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm yeah. kind of in, but I'm not in on it for this Padres team. Um, I no, think that there's no. so many moves to do, and again, they have leverage. You're at least not in a position where you have to get rid of players, and I don't think people take into account oftentimes enough having a cheap owner, what that does to you in trades, because right. the Padres can show up at the bargaining table and be like, look, we're built for right now. We'll just freaking keep him for this year and just try and go for it this year. And then they'll be like, or, or we can extend him. Let's just pretend for a minute, right? That they could extend him because mm-hmm. they've shown that they're willing to. When you're an A's team and you go to the bargaining table, they're like, we know you're getting rid of him. You have to trade him. So we're going to not, we don't have any reason to give you too much because you have to take a deal, right? So I think that's an under discussed part for why like teams like the A's and the Orioles and et cetera, et cetera, get shafted in trade sometimes because the other teams know, right? If you're the Padres or heck the Yankees, the Rangers, if you're thinking about trading a player because it might be too expensive and you don't like the deal you get, you could be like, okay, cool. Dodgers, they don't have to trade Trey Turner in his last year before free agency because they could just resign him. They're the Dodgers. They have enough money yeah. and they're willing to spend it. So that is a huge part of this. And I think that with Soto, like you said, you could get some major league ready players or hope maybe your prospects are a little bit ready to come back up. You can spread it out through the bullpen. It's just it's the most frustrating, maddening team that isn't actually if you step back in the worst position ever. It's just considering all the hype, considering all the personality, all the moves they made this offseason. It's just pretty insane how much yeah. and they sold out more games than they've ever sold out this year. They had a top three attendance and the amount of times I saw the, the Padres fans. I remember there was a home run that Tatis had uh, back in, I'm going to say August or September. I forgot when it was exactly. And it was like in, I think it was August. And they were, it was like a team that's like six games out of the playoffs and he hit this home run to break his streak. He's amped up place goes nuts. That's what they were doing with an in, in the grand scheme of things, an inconsequential game just to see their guy hit a home run. Imagine what they look like if you're actually good and performing. That's why this is so frustrating, even though in a lot of ways, it's a little bit like, you know, uh, you got to accept what you have uh, in a lot of ways. You still have stuff to be excited about. And I think that Padres fans, even if they don't have that big signing this offseason, there's still plenty to be excited about. And we're excited that you're going to be back doing Locked On Padres. (laughs) Tell people where they can follow you and your show. Uh, thank you, man. Uh, you can follow me at Javapeno on Twitter for my money, the best handle on the Locked On MLB channel. That's J A V I I P E N O at L O L O underscore Padres if you want the show account as well. And then Locked On Padres, wherever you get your pods. Same thing for YouTube, whatever. You'll type it, you'll find it. And you could even be mean. I don't care. Uh, all right. I, I, I take all things. All right. Let's quickly do the trivia question, which is going to be Padres yeah. centric. Oh, Who man. was the first player? selected by the San Diego Padres in the expansion draft of 1969. Don't answer it. Put your answer down in in Instagram, Twitter, or everything else, 
and remind you that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24 7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube to, to subscribe to the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel. Easy for you to say. He's Javi Reyes. I am your host. Paul Francis Sullivan, this has been Locked On MLB. At the end, Locked On Padres crossover. Please call me Sully.